Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for the SAF July online training initiative. My name is Janine Colling and I manage the Biogrip Water and Soil Analysis node. This presentation will be an introduction to iron chromatography and it aims to explain what the technique involves and to introduce you to the equipment. To understand iron chromatography, let's briefly look at what an iron is. When a molecule loses or gains an electron, it becomes electrically charged. A positively charged molecule, which has lost an electron, is called a cation. And examples include sodium, calcium and magnesium ions. A negatively charged molecule, which has gained an electron, is called an anion. And examples include chloride, nitrate, nitrite and phosphate. Various instruments exist which can be used to measure ions. In the Biogrip lab, we have an ion chromatography instrument and an automated UV spectrophotometer. Today, we're only going to discuss ion chromatography. Chromatography is a technique which is used for the separation of a mixture of compounds in a solution. The separation of the compounds is based on their interaction or affinity for a mobile and stationary phase. A mobile phase carries the molecules through the system, whilst the stationary phase is a fixed material. Other examples of chromatography include thin layer chromatography, liquid chromatography and gas chromatography. And the separation of the molecules in each of these systems are based on their properties, which determines how they interact with the stationary phase. In the pictures, the ion chromatography instrument in the Biogrip node are visible. The components which are used during ion chromatography include an eluent, which is the mobile phase, a pump to move the eluent and sample through the system, a sample injection mode to introduce the sample into the mobile phase, a separation column, which is a stationary phase where the sample is being separated, and detectors which measures a change in conductivity or measures the absorbance of light by the analytes. Let's take a look at the preparation of the eluent which is used as the mobile phase. The eluent is prepared using ultra pure water which has a resistivity of more than 18.2 mega ohm. The chemicals which are used are the pure salts. Once the eluents are prepared, they are transferred to a bottle containing an aspiration filter, which removes any particles that may be in the eluent. An absorption tube, which is filled with soda lime, is fitted on the lid. The function of the soda lime is for the absorption of acidic gases such as CO2 and for moisture absorption from the atmosphere. This protects the anion eluent from pH changes due to the formation of carbonic acid that will influence the analyte's retention time. The anions and cations are analyzed in separate units as illustrated in the pictures. From the images, you can see that the components in the unit vary slightly. That is because anion analysis makes use of chemical suppression, whilst cation analysis does not. The ions are also separated in two different columns. To enable you to understand the components in the system, we are going to make use of the diagram prepared by Metro. We have just discussed the preparation of the eluent, which is used as the mobile phase. The eluent is first degassed to remove any air that may be present. The eluent is moved through the system using a pump. The high pressure pump is a serial dual piston pump which moves the eluent at a specific flow rate. Next, there is a perch valve which is used to remove any air bubbles in the lines whenever fresh eluents are prepared. This is followed by an inline filter to remove any contaminants from the eluent which protects the columns. Next, there is a pulsation absorber, which smoothens the pressure variations caused by the pump and the injector valve. This protects the separation column and reduces disturbing pulsations 
during conductivity measurement. Next, we come to the injection valve. Sample introduction occurs through a sample loop made from peak material. The sample loop allows different volumes of the sample to be introduced directly into the eluent stream. From here, it moves to the columns. The column is housed in a chamber or oven which has temperature control. The main separation column is attached to a guard column and as the name suggests, the function of the guard column is to protect the main analytical column. The guard and analytical column contains the stationary phase, which interacts with the ions. In the cation column, there are, for example, sulfonate groups, which can bind to the cations. In the anion column, there are typically quaternary ammonium groups, which interacts with the anions. Some separation of the ions, therefore, already occur on the guard column. When the ions move onto the main column, they interact with the stationary phase where they form weak ionic bonds with the stationary phase. The ions separate based on their charge to size ratio. Every component or ion therefore requires a specific and unique time to pass through the stationary phase. This is called the ions retention time. The retention time for each component can be determined and used to identify them. Since the columns are an expensive part of the system, I wanted to mention the measures which are taken to protect the columns. All samples which are submitted for analysis have to be filtered using a 0.45 micron nylon syringe filter to remove particles. Failure to remove the particles can result in blocking of the tubing and the column, which can cause high back pressure and other problems. We also use an inline filter and a guard column to protect the main analytical column. Once the compounds are separated on the column, the two systems become different. The anion system has an additional suppression module. To understand the function of this module, we are first going to take a look at how the ions are detected and quantified. There are many different types of detectors and each of them work on their own principle of how the ions are detected. Examples include a conductivity detector, a UV vis detector, an amperometric detector and a mass spectrometry detector. The IC system which we have makes use of conductivity and UV vis detectors. So for this training video, we're only going to focus on these two. A UV vis detector measures the interaction of molecules or ions with visible and ultraviolet light. If we consider the electromagnetic spectrum, UV light ranges from 190 to 400 nanometers and visible light ranges from 400 to 780 nanometers. Two different types of lamps provide light in each of the spectral ranges. After the molecules are separated on the column, they pass through a cell which is illuminated by the lamps. Certain molecules can absorb the light in the UV vis spectral range and therefore influence the amount of light transmitted. The percentage of light transmitted can therefore be calculated and once this is known, the amount of light absorbed by the molecules can also be determined. During the analysis of the ions, a chromatogram is generated. On the x-axis of the chromatogram, the time for each of the ions to pass through the column and reach the detector is indicated. And this is called the ions retention time. On the y-axis, the amount of light absorbed as recorded by the UV vis detector is indicated. The area underneath the peak is related to the amount of compound in the solution. So the more ions in solution, the more light will be absorbed and the larger the area underneath the peak will be. To quantify the ions in solution, we prepare a standard curve for each of the ions by using a solution containing a known concentration of the ion. By making use of the UV vis detector, the response or area underneath the peak for each of the standard solutions are measured. 
A standard curve is generated where the concentration of the iron is linked to the response or area underneath the peak and a formula describing this relationship can be generated. To measure the concentration of an iron in a sample, the sample is first analyzed on the system and the ions are separated on the analytical column. Next, the ions are detected by the UV-vis detector, which records the chromatogram. Next, the area underneath the peak for each of the ions are measured. By applying the formula from the standard curve, the concentration of the ions in this sample can be determined. The second type of detector is an electrical conductivity detector. EC is the measure of a solution's ability to conduct electricity or an electrical flow. If we have a solution containing ions and we place two electrodes at a set distance from each other in the solution and connect this to the power, the ability of the solution to conduct electricity can be measured. The unit in which EC is measured is microsiemens per centimeter. There are various factors which influence electrical conductivity and these include the temperature of the solution, the type of iron in the solution, and the concentration of the iron in the solution. The higher the concentration of ions in the solution, the higher the conductivity will be. The type of iron in the solution is important because not all charged molecules conduct electricity equally well. For example, hydrogen and hydroxide ions move through the solution rapidly and they are good charge carriers whilst ammonia and chloride move through the solution slowly and they therefore do not conduct electricity well. This property is going to be repeated when we discuss the use of suppression for the measurement of anions. The identification and quantification of ions using an EC detector is similar to that described for UV-vis detection as it also generates a chromatogram. The x-axis is also an indication of the time required for the iron to pass through the column and reach the detector. On the y-axis, the electrical conductivity of the ions are measured and the area underneath each peak is related to the amount of iron in the solution. The more ions there are, the higher the electrical conductivity of the solution will be. A standard curve Using known concentrations of the ions can be generated by recording the EC response for each of the ion concentrations. A formula which links the concentration of the ion to the area underneath the peak can be prepared and this can be used to determine the concentration of an ion in a sample. Now that you understand how the concentration of ions are measured in a solution, we're going to discuss the function or use of suppression for anion quantification. The suppression module consists out of two components. The first is the suppression module and the second is the CO2 suppression. The function of suppression is to reduce the background conductivity of the eluent and increase the analyte conductivity. The eluent used for anion analysis contains bicarbonate and sodium ions, which have a high conductivity, whilst the sodium and anions in the sample have a lower conductivity. During suppression, the sodium ions are exchanged for hydrogen ions, which result in the formation of carbonic acid, which has a lower conductivity. During suppression, the sodium ions in the sample which are related to the eluent are also replaced by hydrogen ions and the resulting products have a higher conductivity. So during suppression, the cations are replaced by hydrogen ions, which lowers the background signal of the mobile phase and increases the signal from the ions which we want to measure. The final step in anion suppression is the CO2 suppressor module. This module further reduces the background conductivity of the eluent to a level below 1 microsiemens. CO2 is removed in the degassing chamber under vacuum. The vacuum chamber is continuously purged by a defined amount of CO2 free filtered ambient air, which is obtained through a CO2 absorber cartridge. 
The cartridge also protects the conductivity suppressor against moisture and CO2. We have now discussed all of the components which make up the anion and cation analysis units and took a brief overview of how they function. The last part of the instrument to discuss is the autosampler. The autosampler allows automated sample preparation and analysis. The system has space for 127 samples and it allows for automated dilution of the sample up to 200 times by making use of ultra pure water. The unit also has an ultrafiltration unit to remove any particles which may be present in the sample. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of how an ion chromatography instrument measures ions in a sample. The last thing we're going to discuss is how to collect and prepare your sample if you want to submit this for ion analysis. First, record the pH and EC of the sample and indicate this on the sample template document, which is available on our website. Next, collect two 50 ml samples if you want to perform both cation and anion analysis. Prior to collection, filter the samples using a 0.45 micron nylon syringe filter and fill the tubes to the brim before capping them. If you're sending a sample for cation analysis, you can add half a mole of a 1 molar nitric acid solution, which has to be prepared using an IC grade nitric acid. This is only done for cations. Clearly label the vials with the sample identity and date and keep the samples cold at all times. Complete the sample list and contact us to arrange a date for sample analysis. Please remember that ions such as nitrite and nitrate have to be analyzed within two days after collection. Send the samples to the indicated address. More information about the BioGrip node for soil and water analysis can be found under the Central Analytical Facility website. Here, you can also find the sample templates and guidelines for sample requirements and preparation. This brings us to the end of this training video. Please go like the Central Analytical Facility Facebook page to receive interesting information about activities, updates and training opportunities at the various units. Thank you for joining us. If you have any more questions, please feel free to contact us by email.